The following talk is offered freely to ensure that no one is ever denied access to these practices and to these teachings. If you feel inspired to make a donation to support this offering, you can go to my website at jonathanfaust.com. While you're there, you can also sign up for a monthly newsletter designed to support you in your practice. Thank you and enjoy. So this talk is on how to increase your toleration for bliss. There's always good news and bad news. So, of course, a doctor walks into a, a patient's room in the hospital and says, well, I have good news and I have bad news. Which would you like first? The patient says, give me the good news. The doctor says, well, they're going to name a disease after you. <laughs> Another doctor says to the patient, I've got good news and bad news. Well, give me the good news first. He said, well, you have 24 hours to say goodbye to all of your loved ones. The bad news is I meant to call you yesterday. One of my favorites since I was about 11, I had a biking ship with all the rowers. You know, the, the guy with the, with the whip says, men, I've got good news and bad news. And the good news, today we're going to have a change of underwear. Okay, you change with you. You change with you. <laughs> the lens we tend to look through depends on, on what we see. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, about some of the descriptions of true nature, because quite often our true nature is referred to as, as a blissful state. And I'd like to talk a little bit about our baked-in negativity bias. And part of being human is looking through this lens of the bad news, but also to also look at our capacity to recognize how we have this slant toward the negative, and some very specific techniques to share with you on how you can train yourself to look for the good, and also when you experience wholesome states, how to amplify them, how to make them more, more alive and more accessible. The basic rule, which you've probably heard, is that the neurons that fire together wire together. So if you tend to look through this lens of negativity, your brain fires more and more in that direction. As the saying goes, when a, when a pickpocket sees a saint, all he sees are the pockets. And we can train ourselves through, through mindfulness, through paying attention, through self-observation without judgment. So we, I imagine many of us have had have had profound, transcendent experiences at different points in our lives. For a number of years, um, I had a number of pretty profound near-death experiences. And uh, I've talked with some of them uh, here, and uh, I won't go into the details, but, but in those moments of finding myself right on the edge between being alive and not alive and being conscious... I really saw that that I wasn't the body, but but I was still there. There was still something there. I saw that I wasn't my thoughts. The thoughts were happening, and I could see how the thoughts were just a result of conditioning. But I wasn't the thoughts. I was the awareness of the thoughts. And when I've had those experiences, and again, we've all had some experience, some brushes with, with death, either personally or those we've lost, when we really let those moments in, we're deeply informed. And what I've found is through, through experiences of death, but also through some of my peak spiritual experiences where I, I kind of open into some form of higher consciousness where I'm less identified with my body and my thoughts and my story and my conditioning, that as I integrate that, I feel more free in life. 
I, I feel less reactive. Um, I'm less attached to things. You know, I can enjoy them, but, but I'm pretty aware that they're going to disappear. And an interesting paradox is that I'm less attached to relationships. Uh, but, I'm, but paradoxically, I enjoy them more. I find that I, I love nature more. That being in nature feeds me more the more I, the more I practice. And I also find that relationally, I, I can see more clearly into people's motivations. And I can see how, just as I'm driven by, by greed and by hatred, so is everyone else. How we're all driven by unmet needs. But I would say, in my experience, through my, my practices, and certainly through these, these experiences of being on the edge of life, that I can say I have a lot more awe around the mystery, a, a lot more amazement. And again, I'm sure that, that you've had experiences like this as well. You know, the Buddha spoke of how the, like the wake-up experiences we have are sickness, old age, and death. That's when we experience that either personally and those around us. There's this, this sometimes a profound jolt of recognizing that, this, that we have this default assumption that we're, that our bodies will always be here, will always be in this body. And when we can remember that, that's when it gets really interesting. And so... All different traditions for eons and eons have been searching to really f discover what is it that goes beyond the body and beyond the mind. What is this, this perennial truth that informs our entire experience? Yoga describes it as sat chit ananda, a combination of sat, truth, chit, knowledge, and ananda, the bliss. It's just the bliss of seeing things as they truly are. Buddhism speaks of the, of the luminous mind, the luminous nature of the mind that sees clearly. It has, a, it has a luminosity about it. We have living in Christ consciousness, living that, in that awakened heart of Christ. In Islam, taqwa is referred to as, again, it's, it's God consciousness. It's living in that consciousness of, of transcendental truth. So when we remember that, that, that this life, this plane that we're living on in these bodies, these portable flesh units, when we remember that all of this can vanish in a moment... It opens us up to new possibilities. Either that's really depressing, or there is a possibility of freedom. Maybe you've seen that bumper sticker that says, life is hard, and then you die. Like That's one perspective. But we can move beyond that negativ negativity bias through practicing awareness and through cultivating the heart. You know, the, uh, the BBC, I read about some experiment years and years ago when the BBC thought, you know, there's so much negativity in the news. What if we created a good news channel? And they, they, did, they did these polls, and everyone's like, you know, that's a great idea. You should have a good news channel. And so they launched it, and it went nowhere. There's just no juice in a headline that says, 5,000 planes took off and landed safely today. Just doesn't do it. So it's very interesting. There's quite a science in headlines. And you can sort of have the positive headline, the neutral headline, and then the grabber headline. So here's an example of, of a positive headline. Measles to be erased by 2025. Here's the neutral headline. Promising trends for measles eradication. 
than the negative, your child could still die of measles. Which one gets our attention? And there's, there's, there's a science, there's a real study of, of how words trigger our brains. And you've heard the phrase with headlines, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, that we're, we're drawn to look toward what doesn't work. We're attracted to, to the catastrophe. And this is basically the nature of the mind. Have you ever ever gone on Yelp to check out a restaurant before you go? There's some really unhappy people on Yelp. <laughs> it's amazing. And I, someone told me they did a study that if you have a positive experience in a restaurant, you'll tell three people. If you have a bad experience in a restaurant, you'll tell 13 people. Again, kind of the nature. This is just the nature of how our mind works. And an interesting fact I came across, uh, that research has shown that strong, long-lasting relationships require a five-to-one ratio of positive to negative interactions in order to thrive by virtue of the fact that negative interactions affect us so much more strongly. So for your relationship to thrive, a five-to-one ratio Again, we're so drawn toward the negative. And of course, we all do this personally. When you think about someone who might be struggling in their life, if they came to you to tell you about their struggles, chances are you have something wise and comforting to say to them. But if it happens to you, we have a tendency to internalize that. And what we do when we're not aware is we have a tendency toward rumination and self-criticism and obsession and anxiety. And two, there's good news, bad news here. The bad news is you have a baked-in tendency to focus on the negative. The good news is you're on to yourself. We actually have the capacity to interrupt the negativity bias. Not in a way that's just feeling good and thinking happy thoughts, but really looking closer at the nature of reality. And that's where the liberation practices come in. When I was about, I was 13, and I was on a a family a vacation in the National Boundary Waters Canoe Area in, in Minnesota on the Canadian border. And we were doing a 13-day paddle with, you know, doing portaging and the whole thing. And I think it was probably around maybe day five, six, seven, eight, it rained. And we had canvas tents and uh, we were cooking with wood. And so we were paddling in the rain we were setting up our camp in the rain, starting fires in the rain, and everything was completely soaked. And at 13, I think I was 6'5 and weighed about 120 pounds. And um, I was so miserable. I remember, um, you know what it's like when, when you're wearing soaked jeans and it's cold? I'm like trying not to move because a whole new section of cold gene material comes in contact with your legs. <laughs> just just standing there. And I, and I said to my father, I said, if I had an anvil, I would tie it around my neck and I would throw it in that lake. And, and my dad gave me a look I had never seen before. Um, my dad had been in World War II, missing in action uh, for a long period of time, wounded twice, um, had really seen a lot of raunchy, raunchy stuff. He, he just looked me in the eye, this like really intense look, and he said, Hey, no one's shooting at us. Suddenly, my, my experience changed quite dramatically. 
we have these capacity, this we have this capacity to remember and reframe our experience. Tony Robbins tells a story of he was giving a seminar and he was asking people, uh, this room full of people, who who felt like they were a success. You know, some people raised their hands. A few people raised their hands, but and he asked this one guy sitting in front, like a really well dressed guy, and he said, "He said, excuse me, sir, you you did not raise your hand. Um, can I ask you a couple of questions?" I said, "Sure." He said, um, "Do you work out?" He said, yeah, I, I run marathons. I run three marathons this year. So, wow. He said, so uh, how much money do you make? He said, this year about $1.2 million. He said, you have kids? He goes, yeah, I've got two kids. And what are they doing? He said, well, they're both, they're both in Ivy League schools. And Tony Robbins said, so you don't... You don't consider yourself a success. Can you explain why? This guy said, well, I run marathons, but, but I'm two-tenths of a percentage off my goal for my body fat. And I make 1.2, but I play golf with some guys who make like 1.8, which drives me nuts. And my kids are going to Ivy, Ivy League schools, but one's majoring in psychology, one in English. I think they're wasting their time. So Tony Robbins thanked him. And then he went over to this guy who had his hand up, and he said, well, so do you work out? I mean, do you, do you have a... And he goes, no, no, not really. He said, how much money did you make last year? He goes, I think $47,000. I said, what do you do? He goes, well, I, um, I drive a bus. And he said, and do you have any kids? He goes, no, no, we never really got around to kids. He said, but you raised your hand, you know, as a success. And the guy said, look, where I come from, every day above ground is a good day. So again, we, our happiness is determined by, by our beliefs. And as much as, as we struggle, one of my teachers once said that, that as we awaken, like as we, you know, we get glimpses of the state of the luminous mind, of, you know, the bliss of clear seeing, you know, much of our practice, they're glimpse practices, you know. We get a glimpse and we keep, keep working. So but when, when there's awakening and there's sort of arriving in that, in that place where you, can, you really have a sense of more of a full awakening, he said the first thing you do is you offer pranams, you bow to your biggest life challenges. Because in those moments, there's a recognition that it's your challenges and your obstacles are exactly what woke you up. And when you think about it, chances are that the times of the greatest struggle in your life are what really built your character. We're beginning to learn more around how, how like resilience and struggle is so integral to, to waking up. In my day, when I was a kid and we played on the playground, it seemed pretty clear that the, the, the design of the playgrounds were pretty much there to kind of kill off the weak and stupid. You know? <laughs> You know, the, the, the jungle gyms with, like, just on asphalt and with the exposed bolts and nuts and <laughs> the seesaws with splinters on them. I mean, it's nuts. And then we got soft. We kind of went in the other direction, you know. Everything's got to be safe for the kids. Well, here's a New York Times headline I ran across. In Britain's playgrounds, bringing in risk to build resilience. So they're bringing back those deadly monkey bars. <laughs> so, so happiness and bliss is not about having no challenges because the challenges are integral to, to waking up and seeing more clearly into the nature of reality. But just as in this practice, we're really exploring that when you are visited by unpleasant when you experience stress, when you experience suffering, rather than habitually moving away from it, 
that when you have when you have the capacity, you actually turn toward those challenges. You actually investigate the nature of of what that stress is all about, and you begin to see that that stress is an integral part of being alive. That there's a cause of stress. That the source and the cause of that stress has some form of clinging, some form of attachment, some form of an inability to let go. And you see through your practice that you have the capacity to let go. You have the capacity to shift. In that same way as we're, we're training ourselves to turn toward the difficult and to see clearly into the nature of reality through the obstacles, that when you experience the opposite, when you experience the wholesome states, when you experience the moments when there's no I, me, and mine, and you feel that sense of expanse, in that same way, it's very, very helpful to turn and examine and get more familiar with those positive and wholesome states as well. Because the more you can pay attention to the wholesome states, the more you're actually conditioning yourself to experience them. The neurons that fire together, wire together. So, wire, hardwiring happiness into your nervous system. It's about taking in the good. Uh, my my friend Rick Hansen talks about this really beautifully in, in Buddha's brain and all of the materials he has out there. If you'd like to learn about neuroplasticity and how it, how it's all tied in to these practices or what's happening in your brain when you're doing this stuff, it's really extraordinary. He says the key here is we're trying to get the good stuff into us. And that means turning our passing positive experiences into lasting emotional experiences. So we can have these moments of, of happiness. Is there a way that we can install them and make them more alive and more real? And again, he says, if someone's upset that you know and love and worried, we try to help them move beyond that state. But when it happens to us, we tend to ruminate and hang on to it. So there's a phrase called samsara. And samsara has to do with the endless cycles of suffering. This is drawing on a little bit of the philosophy here. And again, you don't have to believe this. But part of this is, is really on how in an unexamined life, we're born, we live, and we die again and again and again. We're lost in an endless, endless cycle of desire. Always wanting, always wanting, always avoiding, always avoiding. And there's no end to the predicament. So you can view this from the perspective of lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes of of just stimulus response, stimulus response. But it's usually only when the suffering is really acute that we begin to look for a solution. And sometimes we, we run into these teachings, which can either be you know, through this lens of the Dharma or any perennial truth. A sense of like, so what, what here is really true? When we're lost in endless desire, we may experience passion, but it's not full passion. And it has a lot to do with awe and wonder. Einstein said, he who knows it not and can no longer wonder, no longer feel amazement, is as good as dead a snuffed out candle. So what does it mean to feel amazement, to really feel awe in our practice? There's such a tendency to just fall asleep in this life. 
I was once um, uh, on a, leading a retreat, and uh, my wife Tara was talking about how, uh, imagine how if once every 500 years uh, we turned from our televisions and just once all the stars came on at the same time, how amazed we would be and how much we take for granted <clears throat> the stars. I couldn't resist it a couple days later when I gave my talk. I said, imagine if once every 500 years all the televisions turned on, how amazed we would be. (laughs) So I'd like to talk a little bit about this, this sense of amplifying the good. Because we have this such a built-in negativity bias, when something good happens, we tend to kind of move on to the next thing, the next thing that might happen. And what they found is we tend to have a happiness level. We're, 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 and it's sort of part of our individual conditioning. We're only allowed to be so happy. And then we start distrusting life or we'll self-sabotage or whatever. So what we really need to do is to learn how to increase our capacity for happiness. So here are the things that that Rick talks about, and then we'll, we'll, we'll try this on in meditation. So as the neurons that fire together, wire together, when you feel happiness, when you feel bliss, when you feel something positive, here are the things you do. The first has to do with duration. When you're aware you're experiencing something really positive, can you sustain it? Is it possible to to really be with it and and sense what it's like just to stay on on the wave of that positive experience? The second is to look for the intensity. Can you can you let it get big? Can you allow that 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 feeling? To grow. The third is to feel it in your body. Again, your, your, our issues are in our tissues. It's one thing to sort of think about a positive experience. It's another one to sense if you can locate what it feels like. Really em- embody it. Sense it on the inside. The fourth is to look for the novelty. What's, what's unusual? What's interesting? As you're exploring that positive feeling, is, can you feel it somewhere? Maybe you never felt it before. Or look for a way that feels really fresh or different. That's going to stimulate your brain and make it more alive. The fifth has to do with, with a more of an emotional quality, and that is to reflect on, on its personal relevance. To ask yourself, why is this feeling important to me? Why does this matter to me? And and you might sense, oh, that has a quality of of really intimately sensing it and why, why it's important for you. The sixth quality is to is to, to, to receive it, to really say, Yes, let me really receive it. Can you really let it sink in? And the seventh is to look for what's enjoyable. So when you focus on the enjoyable quality of it, it has a way of kind of heightening the flow of neuroepinephrine and dopamine. You know, that pleasure stimulates the brain. So let's try a little practice, if you don't mind. If you like, you can close your eyes and... You might like to slow down and deepen your breath. And if you would, if you can direct your mind to to a memory of something pleasant, something wholesome you may have experienced recently. It might be something you're grateful for, something you appreciate. Maybe a sense of someone being kind. 
And take a few moments to kind of go through the files and something you're grateful for, something you appreciate, something that touched you recently. And if you have a sense of it, to bring it a little more alive, you might sense if you can create a visual representation of it. Can you imagine it, either as a still image or a moving image? If there are any words or sounds that you associate with it, what might they be? And as you think about this, can you begin to sense what it feels like inside? And just sense, is it possible to stay with this, just to be with it, to get more familiar with it? You might just deepen and lengthen the breath just a little bit and sense, sense its intensity. Where do you feel it the most predominant right now? Could you give it permission to, to grow or spread or move? Where do you feel it? Is there a sense of, of why this feeling is important to you? Why does this matter in your life? Is it possible to let it sink in? Imagine you're deeply receiving this positive, wholesome feeling inside. Can you make room for any sense of enjoyment you might have? In these final moments, you might just sense what it might be like for your life if you were to to be more open and vulnerable to the good. And when you experience the waves of wholesome feelings, to slow down, to make room for them, to feel them inside, and to reflect on, on why opening to these wholesome states is important. And to truly receive the waves of, ple of pleasant when they're here. And as you're ready, you can deepen your breath. If you like, you can open your eyes or you can remain with them closed. We're going to take just a few more minutes. So as you explore increasing your capacity for happiness and bliss, there are a couple things just to mention before we close. And one of them is they found that when, when, when people are really struggling in their lives, one of the most profound antidotes is to be of service to others. That when you're helping other people, it has a real capacity to move your energy in really, really powerful, wonderful ways. And it's important as you explore what it means to cultivate more happiness and more bliss in your life that, that one of the one of the shadow sides is if you start chasing it. As soon as you start chasing it is when you begin to lose it. But remembering that when it's here, when you are visited by grace, to make room for it, to savor it, because 
as in all things, it has a tendency to move and shift and change. Ajahn Chah, who was one of the one of the most uh, profound teachers in this tradition, kind of described that moving through life, the main affliction we experience is wanting and not wanting. It's so simple, but it says it all right there. That when we want and when we don't want, we're setting ourselves in opposition to what is. And when we can begin to recognize that we have the capacity to slow down, broaden our awareness, and say yes to what's here, that when we experience the, the waves of unpleasant to make room for them, but when you do experience those wonderful shifts in consciousness, when that sense of I and me and mine gets porous or it falls away, to be sure to slow down and to get intimately familiar with those states of consciousness. Because the more familiar you get with them, the more it literally changes your brain. It changes your perspective in life. So why don't we close with a, another short meditation. And I have a little reading here from Joseph Campbell, who's a bliss specialist. <laughs> If you'd like, again, you can close your eyes. This is entitled, Follow Your Bliss. The divine is ubiquitous. Only your eyes are not open to it. Awe is what moves you forward. Live from your center. The divine lives within you. The separateness apparent in this world is secondary. Beyond the world of opposites is an unseen but experienced unity and identity in all of us. Participate joyfully in the sorrows of the world. You cannot cure the world of sorrows, but you can choose to live in joy. You must return with this bliss and integrate it. The return is seeing the radiance is everywhere. The world is a match for you. You are a match for the world. The spirit is the bouquet of nature. The sanctity, the sanctity, the place you are in. Follow your bliss. In these final moments, of reflecting on these words from Ajahn Chah. That the affliction of life is wanting and not wanting. In these moments, you might just sense, in the absence of wanting, what is your experience right now?
And gently deepening your breath. In your own way, wishing yourself well on your journey, on your path. And as you're ready, you can gently open the eyes. Thank you for your time and attention. Again, a big thanks to all those who, who serve to make, uh, make Monday night happen. So follow your bliss, but also follow the scent of the cookies, which may be the same thing. Enjoy your week.